Welcome to this edition of the Your Weekly Dose of Nonprofit Podcast, the podcast that delivers actionable items you can implement at your organization right away. I'm your host, Ephraim Gopin of 1832 Communications. Today, I'm really happy to have with us a nonprofit and fundraising expert, Mike Dirksen. Mike, how are you doing today? I am uh, too blessed to be stressed, so I'm doing well. How about you? <laughs> I absolutely love that. Too blessed to be stressed. That's great. Uh, let's introduce you to our listeners, watchers, and readers. Mike Dirksen is the principal of Build Good, a Canadian fundraising agency that helps nonprofits raise more money from individual donors by creating a clear message and building a strong direct response program. He's also the host of the Build Good podcast, and he recently launched 5minutefundraisingfix.com, a video mini course you can access for free that will help you create a clear and compelling fundraising message to grow your nonprofit so you can do more good. In today's episode, we're going to discuss direct mail, so let's dive right in. Mike, with email, texting, social media, and a million different outlets, in general, is direct mail still king? Is it still king? I mean, I, mean, I think it's easy to discount direct mail at, at the front end. It, it's certainly fairly expensive. Um, it appears outdated. It's not environmentally friendly. Um, it has long production and lead times. And uh, some donors complain that they don't like it. And, and those donors, um, if, if, if they complain about that, they, you know, they probably shouldn't be getting it. Um, effective direct mail often isn't on brand, which, which can drive some organizations and communications and, and fundraising folks uh, a little bit crazy. Um, you know, certainly direct mail acquisition is harder than it has been in the last few years. And, and maybe with, with, with the global pandemic and stuff that, that might change. Uh, so for that and other reasons, a lot of organizations are going for digital first approach or even a digital only approach. Um, but if we're comparing direct mail to everything you've mentioned, to email, text, so far direct mail uh, is still more effective than any other medium at acquiring uh, donors, at acquiring larger gift donors specifically. It still drives a lot of online giving. Depending on where you live in the world, only 6 to 12% of income actually comes in online. Everything else is not um, online. Uh, we know from MRI studies that, uh, that holding a physical piece of mail in your hands actually uh, increases uh, your likelihood of remembering it. Um, it also triggers a part in the brain that is responsible for, for value and for desirability. And uh, direct mail also still drives a large amount of, of monthly giving, and it still drives a large amount of legacy giving, which is the biggest gift. I mean, most of your donors, for most of your donors, that's the biggest gift they will ever give to your organization. So to your question, is it still king? Uh, if we listen to what donors are telling us by what they do and by their actions, it certainly remains one of the most uh, effective and efficient ways of, of building relationships and deepening relationships with our donors. Uh, should you only focus on direct mail? Uh, no. Um, but should direct mail be uh, like a core part of your communications and fundraising strategy? Uh, for most organizations, I think that answer remains yes. Excellent answer. So let's follow up on that. Is direct mail a once a year proposition such as towards the end of the calendar year, or should nonprofits make use of direct mail multiple times during the year? I mean, in, in broad terms, at, at least the clients that we get to do the best work for, um, they sort of look at the year in four quarters and once a quarter, they are running uh, a direct mail appeal, an integrated direct mail appeal um, with everything else. So um, if you think of the year in four quarters, quarter one, you're going to do, you're going to ask for money. You're going to uh, give the, the donor problem to solve. You're going to open up a story loop. Um, people might contribute to that campaign. Um, you're going to follow uh, what our friend and colleague Stephen Screen calls the virtuous fundraising cycle, which is ask, thank, report, repeat. Uh, so you're going to thank them profusely. And then toward the end of that quarter, you're going to update them on what their gift has done, uh, usually through uh, a, a mailed newsletter. Um, sometimes it's an impact letter, depending on, on what you do. And so that's when you close that story loop and then you're in quarter two and you repeat it all over again. So um, most people send out at least four direct mail um, letters per year, plus 
for newsletters. Plus in the background, you probably also have running uh, probably an annual survey. You probably are sending out new donor welcome packs in the mail. Uh, you might do a few monthly donor conversion campaigns. You might do a legacy campaign. So your donors are usually hearing from you every four to six weeks, which means that you as a nonprofit, you are always in production. And that's the way that you have to look at yourself is, is basically a media organization that is always producing content and always in production. Now, if you do that, if you can manage to, to do this well, at first you spin up this, this fundraising communications flywheel. And at first it might go slower, but once it's up to speed, it'll run really consistently and really evenly. And what it'll do for you is it'll increase the retention rate of your donors. It'll increase um, the amount of times they give, the frequency. It might increase their total giving in the year. It might increase their gift amounts it will surface for you monthly giving prospects, people who just give to you quite often. Uh, it'll surface middle and major donors. So these are people that might raise their hand with a bigger gift and say, I'm interested in, in giving more. Uh, it'll also surface legacy leads for you. And all of that, you can't do that by sending out a, a direct mail appeal letter once a year or twice a year. This needs to be a completely integrated, consistent engine that is running day in, day out, year after year. Excellent answer. Um, so given that, that it's year round, let's go to today's actionable item. Could you please tell us three to five things a nonprofit must prepare in advance before sending out that direct mail packet? Three to five things. Well, I'm, I'm going to give you one thing every nonprofit needs to do before they send out a direct mail pack. And that thing has many, many different parts to it. So um, usually it goes like this. Um, somebody is tasked with creating, somebody in-house is tasked with creating the direct mail appeal. And if you, do, if you do this, agencies will do this for you. But let's say you're doing this in-house, you're tasked with doing this, this direct mail appeal. And um, here's what happens. You write the letter, you take it back to either the CEO or the director of development. They pull in some program people, they pull in some other people. Everybody starts critiquing the letter. You get it back, you make changes, you send it back to them. They're still not happy, they make some more changes. Every single person that is asked to look at the letter thinks that they have to add value to the process by changing stuff, um, which is fair and valid um, because we've asked them for feedback. So naturally they're going to give us the feedback. So we can't be too upset if that happens because we're the ones who made the mistake of involving too many people. And um, in all of those meetings, that's where good fundraising goes to die. So the way that you can prevent this and the way um, th that you can more successful direct mail packs is by doing a strategic brief. It's necessary. Sometimes program people have to be involved. Uh, sometimes just for people are involved. And sometimes it's actually good to get different perspectives. So let's say that we can circumvent that. So let's do this. Let's get everyone who will have um, who, who will need to give their input. Let's get them all in a room before we write the first word of the direct mail appeal. Let's sit in there for an hour. Let's create a project brief together. And the brief is going to be very, very detailed. We're going to say, here's what we're going to mail. Here's, um, it's going to be an outer envelope. It's going to be two pages. It's going to be this. It's going to be this. Here's who will get it. These are the segments who will get this. Uh, here's what we're going to say. Here's the story we are going to use. Here is the offer we are going to use. Uh, here are some red flags of things that we can't say um, or that maybe we need to be sensitive about. Uh, here are the resources that we need to make it happen. Here is the timeline. And as part of that timeline, we are going to choose one or two people in this room to approve the letter for the rest of the room. We're all going to agree. This person, we trust this person to sign off on this at the end. After this meeting, we all agree on the strategic brief. As long as the end piece sticks to the brief, we trust the person that we're going to select one or two people to sign off on this. That way, everyone gets their input. They don't get to see the letter later before it goes out. We have selected one or two people to make that choice. And in the timeline, we've also given them not a lot of time to make that choice. So the approval process has to be quick. And we all sign off on this and we all agree that as long as we stay on strategy and on brief, 
we're all happy with it basically. So we've all given our input. We've all added value to the process. Um, you as a fundraiser, you've built a bit of buy-in with the rest of your team. And hopefully this is going to cut down a lot of time, a lot of frustrations, a lot of other meetings later. And hopefully this will make your job a lot easier. And the great thing is that after you walk out that meeting with that brief, half your appeal is written for you because you know what the story is, you know what the offer is. And so writing that appeal becomes a lot easier. So that, that, that's my one tip for anybody who's producing direct mail in-house. Always start with a brief. And if a lot of questions come up later and people want to change stuff, you say, well, listen, we agreed to this strategy, so let's stick with this. I hear your concern and understand it. So next time we have one of these meetings, save it for then. And the next time we do this, we can incorporate your suggestion. Um, but don't, uh, once, you've, you, once you have that brief and everyone's agreed to it, you got to try to stick to it as well as possible. That is a fantastic answer. Uh, your company, buildgood.org, produces compelling direct mail fundraising campaigns using cases for support designed to get the reader's attention and move them to action. What elements make up a compelling direct mail ask? Uh, we could be here all day on this. Um, so direct mail is, is super tactic driven and, and there's a lot of stuff to this. But uh, I, I think the one thing that I would say that, that would make any direct mail or any piece of direct response, email, text, phone calls, uh, even major gift solicitations, what, what, would, what would make them better is having a good offer. And it's surprising how often uh, direct mail or, or fundraising pieces just don't have a clear offer. So basically a good offer just gives the donor a really clear and urgent problem to solve. And you want to present that urgent and clear problem really, really early on in the message. You want to lead with it. Now your donor's brain is super busy. Your donor is working hard all day. They come home, they look at your piece. Um, their brain has burnt a lot of calories. And so you need to lighten the load of your donor's brain. You need to make it very easy for your donor's brain to understand in a second or less if this is interesting or not. And if it's not interesting, the brain goes, oh, shut down. I'm gonna preserve some calories because I might need them later. So if you open with a problem, you open a story loop, all of a sudden there's interest and intrigue. There's something for the brain to start to think about. So you wanna give your donor a, a clear and urgent problem to solve. Uh, the problem uh, can't be too big. So your donor knows that she on her own can't end homelessness. Um, she knows that. It sounds lofty and, and it sounds aspirational. And maybe for some major donors, that's like a really big vision that might inspire them. For, for most people, they know that. They know that they can't end homelessness, but maybe they can provide a meal. Maybe they can, they, they can provide a bed for the night. Maybe they can contribute to some employment training. That's something they can do. And lastly, uh, you want to give the, the donor a really powerful role to play in fixing that problem. Um, so you say, you, and the way you do that is, is you ask your donor to help your beneficiary, not you. You don't say help us provide meals or help us provide shelters. You say help Brian have a, have a safe place for the night or, or, or this animal needs you right now. So you wanna make sure that donor knows that, that she is needed to solve uh, an urgent problem, a clear problem, a fixable problem, something that's not too big and that somebody on the other end is really going to benefit uh, from her action and that she actually has the autonomy and, and that she can do this, that she can actually solve this problem. So I, I would start there. And if that's not clear, if, if you glance at a piece and it's not very clear what the problem is and what you're being asked to do and, and, and what your donation will do, then, then go back to the drawing board and, and, and try to just think about that. What is a really clear urgent, defined problem the donor can solve, something they can do that's not too big, it's something that's clear. And hopefully you can also come up with a clear dollar handle of what it might take to solve that problem. Perfect, excellent, love that answer. Okay, top to bottom. Um, every nonprofit, if they just listen to that, you have the recipe for success. Um, you wrote an excellent post about the what if game. Could you tell us a little bit about the game and how it can help an organization move forward? 
Yeah, so we've got a few different games that we play with clients. These are all strategy games. They're meant to make um, planning and strategy more fun because planning and strategy meetings are so boring most of the time. So the game that you mentioned, uh, we, we call that game the game of constraints. So a few of our games follow a what if pattern. This one is the game of constraints. And the game is to come up with a few different scenarios that, that might seem implausible, but not impossible. So something that very likely is not going to happen, but that could happen. And so then you take those scenarios and you brainstorm with your team what you would do if that happened. And so each scenario has a bit of a constraint to it. So maybe one scenario that, that might be useful at this time, you know, if you played a game that said, what if starting tomorrow, we could not send direct mail to our donors anymore? What if uh, you know, the postal service goes on strike or uh, you and I are recording this during the coronavirus pandemic and early on in the pandemic, it certainly looked like that was a possibility. So print shops were calling us and saying, yeah, we might have to shut the shop down if there's a total lockdown. And so all of a sudden your lead times for printing that were already like a few weeks, all of a sudden looked like they were gonna be months. And so that's, a, that's kind of an impossible, implausible scenario, but not impossible. So uh, if that's a scenario, what, if, what would you do if you couldn't mail your donors a single piece of mail tomorrow, what would you do? And so your team starts brainstorming and you just wanna write down as many ideas as possible on a post-it. And uh, listen, these ideas can be outlandish, um, that's okay. Um, but just try to, to think, um, what could we do? Now in this case, like, like most people in this case would say, oh, we'll email our donors. Perfect. Now we've got a great starting point to create an email strategy. Now let's look at how many emails do you actually have on file? Okay, it turns out we have 20% of our donors, we have an email for them on file. Okay, so you can't reach anyone by the mail tomorrow. Now you can only email 20% of your donor file. What's your open rate? Ah, around 50%. All right, so now we're talking to 10% of your donor file if tomorrow you can't mail anymore. So that indicates that you've got tremendous opportunity to work on getting uh, your emails opened. So, so start testing with headlines and, and with different things you can do. And you've got tremendous opportunity to actually start harvesting more email addresses because only 20% on file is probably not enough. Uh, now, part of this game is to, to get people to, to think creatively. The other part is also um, some of these scenarios, people just go like, oh, that's impossible. I don't know what we would do. And then 10 minutes later, after people brainstorm, because they've, they've been put, they've been given a constraint, they've been put in a box, all of a sudden, what feels restrictive becomes very, very creative. Because now you have to be creative to overcome that constraint. And 10 minutes later, people go from that's impossible to, you know what, I think we might be fine. I think we would figure this out. I think we can do this. And so it, it also boosts your confidence in your ability to actually raise more funds. I think it's a, it's, it's a brilliant idea. I happen to have the post and the idea behind it, I absolutely uh, loved it uh, as far as building things out and being able to brainstorm. Um, it's, a, it's an excellent, excellent game to play with any organization. Um, let's move on to the lightning round and learn more about you. What got you started on your nonprofit career path? It's a little bit like you. I, I was sort of born into it. So I, I grew up in, in South America and in a very, very poor country. And so we, we were certainly middle class, but everyone around us was extremely poor. And um, just a lot of examples of extreme poverty right next door. And so my parents both worked for nonprofits. My dad was a CEO of nonprofit. My mom um, was a nurse at, at an organization that worked with street kids and, and with orphaned children. And so we were always very close to the work growing up. I was always really interested in marketing and in advertising and in persuasion. Um, as I got older, I was really interested in creativity and business. Um, but I wanted my work to have meaning and to matter and uh, to, to have purpose. And, and, and I think you can find that anywhere else. I, I don't mean that you can only find it in the nonprofit sector, but I found that I can apply my skills here. I can make make a difference. Uh, I'm suited for this kind of work. And uh, it's, it's been very rewarding and very fulfilling. So given your years of experience, if there's one thing you could shake up in the nonprofit world, what would it be? Uh, in the lightning round, if there's one thing I could shake up. Um, I'll try to keep this brief, but I think most nonprofits should kill their mission statement. Um, mm. Mission statements by and large are, are vague, they're run on sentences, they're not defined and clear, 
they are uh, overly ambitious and not that a nonprofit shouldn't have an ambitious mission, but they're written in such a way that it seems outlandish because you're not even sure what exactly they're trying to achieve. And so I, I don't think it serves anybody. Uh, oftentimes you ask 10 different people who work at a nonprofit what their mission statement is, you get 10 different answers. Uh, nobody really seems to know these statements because they're so long. And so I think, you know, we're talking about playing a game of constraints. I think every nonprofit should play this game. If our mission statement was only 10 words long, what would it be? Now, when you talk to donors, no donor will ever tell you. If you ask them, hey, what do you think about this organization? What do you think they do? They won't say, well, they end hunger in all its forms so people can live in dignity and peace and justice and wake up with a brighter future and hope for tomorrow and less food like insecurity for their children. Like, they just don't know what any of that means. They'll say like, well, those are the people that, that, that feed hungry people or those are the people that work with refugees or those are the people that shelter the homeless. And so we are often so afraid of using plain and simple and concrete language because we think our donors are really sophisticated and if we make it too simple maybe donors would think that the work is too simple um, but the opposite is true um, the simpler we make things the clearer it is for donors to understand what we do the clearer it is for us to motivate our staff and uh, it, it serves our beneficiaries a lot more it serves our donors a lot more and so I think mission statements should become clearer more simple more plain language and a lot punchier 10 words or less I absolutely 100% co-sign. That is an excellent, excellent answer to that question. Uh, the best and hardest part of running your own company. Well, every morning I get to drive my daughter to school and I get to pick her up every afternoon. Um, I'm, I'm in charge of, of my time and my schedule. So that's the best part. Um, it's also the worst part. So when you're taking holidays, you're always carving out a little bit of time um, to do work. And so um, it's, it's, it's for sure a blessing that you get to control your schedule and that, that you can be more in control of your time at the same time um, that ends up bleeding a lot into your personal life. And, and I think that's true for, for most jobs today. I, th I think the, um, the, the home life and, and job life balance, that whole thing is, is hard for anyone to figure out. Yep. Uh, person or mentor who influenced you the most? Certainly I've had a lot of, a lot of, good friends and, and bosses and, and, um, and mentors in my life. But when it comes to fundraising and, and marketing, a lot of it, a lot of my mentors have been books. And it, it still amazes me that for 20 bucks, you can, you can buy a book, you can spend five to 10 hours with it, and you've downloaded the brain of, of an expert in a field, uh, if you're willing to spend 20 bucks and, and a few hours. So um, there's a guy by the name of Donald Miller. I read everything he, he puts out. I've taken his courses. I've learned a lot from him. Um, in terms of, of other mentors in the forms of books, um, this one for your, for your readers who are, who are watching this, your listeners who are watching this, Advertising Secrets of the Written Word by Joseph Sugarman. Um, so this is anybody who really wants to persuade, needs to use persuasion for anything. Um, not just for direct mail and, and fundraising. It's just a, a fantastic book. If, uh, uh, yeah, if, if you need to communicate a big idea and, and you need to persuade people to join you on that big idea, you should definitely read that. And then my mouse pad is this book. It's it Tested Advertising Methods um, by John Caples. Fantastic book when it comes to direct response and the value of testing. Love that. That's your mouse pad. Excellent. Um, why Winnipeg? You know, my parents moved here uh, when I was younger and I never moved away. Uh, Winnipeg is in the middle of Canada. We have the coldest winter in all the land. Um, so it's certainly um, in the winter, it's a fairly harsh place to live, um, but that just creates an amazing community. Um, so hardy prairie people who, who live here and work here and Winnipeg is often, uh, Manitoba is often named um, Canada's most generous province per capita. Um, it's probably the hardest place to get anyone to move to, uh, but it's also a very hard place to get anyone to move out of. Uh, so we, you know, we're in the middle of the country, we, we can be in each coast by grabbing a, a, a two or three hour plane. Um, it's a good place to be. It's very good people. And the cost of living is very affordable. All excellent reasons. Um, let's turn the table. You get to ask me a surprise question. I have no idea what's coming. Go ahead. All right. So I know that, that you're a bit of an 80s music geek slash expert. 
Um, and so I had a question about an artist named Meatloaf. Now, Meatloaf was big in the 80s. My question is about a song that came out in the early 90s. And, you know, Meat, Meatloaf goes like, I do anything for love, but I won't do that. I want to know from you, what wouldn't he do for love? What wouldn't he do for love? So I have to tell you, first of all, I'll start with a quick story. I can tell you exactly where I was the first time I heard that song. I was in my roommates in college when it came out. I was in my roommate's car. We were driving in New York City and I had a friend with me who was returning to her college dormitory. And the three of us heard the song. They had already heard it. I had not heard it yet. And uh -huh. so it was interesting for them to watch me listen to a six, seven minute song and um, try and start uh, figuring out the lyrics and going. And halfway through, I realized, oh my God, that's what he's talking about. And they burst out laughing. So, uh, so the question is, what wouldn't he do for love? Yeah. Well, he says I would do anything and I have to take him at his word. Right. But I won't do that. But I won't do that. So that was, so the question was what that, that was. And that's why I say uh -huh. they burst out laughing because I had my own ideas. And I think a lot of people have their own ideas of what the song, what that, that is. Um, so going back to what you said about being very clear with donors, that is, I would not, but I won't do that. I wouldn't use such a line in a direct mail piece because you will create all kinds of confusion uh, right. and they will go out of there. On the other hand, he did it very smartly and expertly because now he got everybody talking about what it was. Now, if you imagine, this is still the early 90s when radio didn't, you know, Howard Stern was big, but radio didn't necessarily cover certain issues and we'll leave it at that. Right. If he did that today, oh, everybody would just speculate all over Twitter and it would be a free-for-all. But back then, it was still a little taboo for him to be going, but I won't do that. <laughs> and some people had ideas of what that was. And they're like, oh, no, you can't talk about it. And how could you play that song? I remember there were people who said, don't play that song on the radio right. because of that. So um, what the what is, I could speculate from here till next week. Um, but I will go with, I would do anything for love. Um, and I will leave it at that. Like I said, I remember the first time I heard it, what I thought it was, and we'll just keep that off the air. But uh, my friends had a, just a laugh of a lifetime watching my face suddenly light up and go, oh my God, he's talking about, and they lost it as we're driving, <laughs> as we're driving towards uh, Midtown Manhattan. So yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, I, I actually have no idea. I, I have no idea what he's talking about. Um, so I, I thought maybe you could clear that up for me. Oh, I would say read Wikipedia. And then you can start from there going down the rabbit hole. Gotcha. Because I remember there were a lot of different theories. Again, I was 20 and in university, so my head was in a different space than where it would be now that I'm much older and maybe more mature. But, um, but yeah, you, you can start on Wikipedia. I would say start there, work your way and see where you end up. I started with the 80s music expert and I'm going to move on to Wikipedia. Yes, pretty much. I'm that's where I'm telling you to go. Also, remember that song came out in the '90s, so it's early out '90s. My, yeah. it's out of my area of expertise, you know. Although yeah, I know yeah. the song well, I'll say it's out of so <laughs> easy way for me to get out of having to answer the question. <laughs> but an excellent question, nonetheless. I like it a lot. Uh, thank you very much for appearing on the podcast today. Check out Mike's company at buildgood.org, and you should definitely connect with him on Twitter at Mike Dorkson. Mike, have a wonderful day. Thanks for having me. A pleasure. Take it easy.